Radio 1's Chris Moyles is Patrick Kilty's guest tonight at 10.35 here on BBC One. Before we get started on the summer of sport, we'd like to send our congratulations to David and Victoria Beckham and our commiserations to Romeo Beckham. <laughs> With David and Jonathan this week is the American goalkeeper who performed so brilliantly in the World Cup. In fact, he used to be a basketball player. His knack of dropping the ball into the net was one of the reasons that Liverpool got rid of him. Lad Friedel. <laughs> With Gary and Rory this week is an impressionist who famously pretended to be William Hague and got through on the phone to Tony Blair. At least he thought it was Tony Blair. It turned out to be Rory Bremner. John Coltshaw. <laughs> we kick off the new series with our celebrations round, looking at the stories behind a pair of sporting celebrations. David, Jonathan and Brad. We take you back to the World Cup and the game between the new titans of world football, South Korea and the US. From Lee Yul Yul. This looks promising. Very promising. And Yul Hwan, the Perugia striker, makes it 1-1. Did you notice, sir, that when that clip came on, Brad looked that way? Mm. Which seemed to be exactly what he was doing. <laughs> <laughs> you play football, don't you? I do. Is it fun? <laughs> <laughs> you see, you ask him for trouble, and you're giving us a South Korea question, because, you know, when you talk about Korea on this show, inevitably we start talking about, shall we refer to it as canine cuisine? <laughs> <laughs> they, they love the taste of dog over there, it's got to be said. No, you don't. Crufts in South Korea, it's presented by Jamie Oliver. <laughs> How was the whole experience down there? Were you uh, surrounded by security and stuff? Being yeah, when we first got there, it was not during that cross. You weren't. <laughs> <laughs> but they had left by security. We were playing Korea. They had all gone away then. We were um, we were swamped by uh, USCIA SWAT teams from Korea. Took us to the DMZ, the demilitarized zone there, and uh, we were about ten feet away from the North Koreans who wanted to shoot us. So <laughs> let me get this straight: the CIA were guarding you and chose to take you to the demilitarised zone where you could be shot at by the North Korea. Technically, yeah, I guess. I loved the World Cup, and I enjoyed watching the Brazilians in particular with that fantastic, with the, with the, the three W's at the front there, Ronaldo, Ronaldino, and... <laughs> it was a very exciting viewing. Jonathan, it's nice to see you again, actually. Can I just say the seat? Can you stand up? Sure. Uh, look at that. Never has the expression long streak of piss been so appropriate. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I'm Jonathan Watts, the only movie reviewer who went to see Austin Powers for the fashion tips. <laughs> <laughs> You're only here because we couldn't get Alastair McGowan, you know that. <laughs> You're only here because we couldn't get Alastair McGowan. <laughs> <laughs> but that's well, a terrible goal. You would have to be an idiot to let a goal in that. <laughs> but I do know the answer. Of course oh, you know the answer, because you're the idiot that let the goal in. <laughs> the celebration um, depicted when in, uh, in the Olympics, I think in Utah, mm -hmm. a U.S. judge deemed a, uh, a South Korean speed skater to have fouled an American speed skater, gave the gold medal to the American. Is a correct answer for three points. Well done. It was a reference to a previous encounter between South Korea and the US in the Winter Olympics in Salt Lake City in February when Korea's speed skating god Kim Dong-sung was controversially disqualified, allowing America's Apollo Ono to win gold. And Ono's in pursuit of a gold medal. <laughs> Trying to get through, he was blocked there by Kim. Oh, he had to give ground to Kim. Ono's in silver medal place, China a bronze. And we'll have to wait and see if there's a disqualification. Oh, Ono's got it! The judges have given it to Ono! After the game, millions of Koreans poured into the streets of Seoul. It was the biggest crowd since a dog lorry crashed into the barbecue sauce factory. <laughs> that 
is wasted. It is, <laughs> but quite funny. Yeah. Kim Dong Sung is known as the David Beckham of South Korea. He even has a celebrity wife, badly sung. <laughs> Gary, Rory and John, it's cricket for you and England captain Nasser Hussein Century in the final of this summer's NatWest Challenge against India. And there's his first one-day international hundred. <laughs> so why the gesture, Gary's team? Is he point at the back reminding Gower of his best test score. <laughs> <laughs> it's definitely something to do with the number three, isn't it? Yeah. Yeah. Number of people watching David on Sky. <laughs> <laughs> he was swearing, wasn't he? It he was saying like the F word. Like Did you ever do that when you were England captain, Gary? No, I didn't. I'm sure there was one occasion when you said, what the f*** is that? And somebody said, it's the halfway line, Gary. <laughs> <laughs> well, it might have been that one. <laughs> Perhaps he was just a confused Star Trek fan. He might have been meaning to do the Vulcan salute or something, mm. but end up doing that. Captain's log. That's what you used to get when you faced West Indian <laughs> fast bowlers. <isn't> <laughs> <laughs> but America will not tolerate the evil actions of this tyrant, Nasser Hussein. <laughs> <laughs> Who is that? <laughs> It's a typical American virtue for you. <laughs> NASA was doing the W signal. That's the signal W. That's the internationally recognised signal for when people need me to come to their aid. It's like the bat signal. Wassy, it brings up the weather. There's it's a child in need of laughter. <laughs> <laughs> for more reasons than one, Gary. Really? <laughs> Apparently the bend doesn't interfere with the pleasure, though. <laughs> I, really, I can't imagine you as a superhero. I'd make a great superhero. <laughs> when you were young, you must have been bitten by a radioactive twat. <laughs> <laughs> from my own captain, Glenn. Do you... Oh, no, no. There you go for him. <laughs> You've done a Chris bad, haven't you? With Lennox, with you and Lennox Lewis, John. Oh, yeah, you know, hey, you know, I mean, you know, I knocked out Mike Tyson and I won the WBC title, but, you know, the pinnacle, that was, you know, doing the Chris bad work with you, man. Yeah, when I was pushing his head down. Not in that way, but in that yeah. way. Wait, they didn't show <laughs> <that>. <laughs> They didn't show the bit where I knocked him out. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, <laughs> yeah, in my fight, you know, they didn't show me the bit where I knocked Lennox out either. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Come on, what's the answer, boys? He's, batting, he's third in the batting order, and it was suggested in some quarters, uh, Sky seven. Television and the David Gow, that he's not good enough to bat number three. Yes, he's correct for three points. <laughs> you see an explained. I'm sure that most people don't give a monkey's where I bat, but there's been one gentleman who's been permanently on my case, putting me under pressure. NASA didn't name names, but he did say that if he ever catches up with him, he'll tip the silver-haired old granddad out of his bath chair. <laughs> <laughs> In recent years, David here has become known as the face of Sky Cricket and the hair of Hetty Wainthrop Investigates. <laughs> uh, and at the end of that round, David's team have three points, and Gary's team have three points. It's our excuses round now. David's team, we return once more to that traditional summer sport, football. Here's Emil Heskey doing what he does best, falling flat on his arse. <laughs> Heskey's in the middle here. Here's Heskey. And Heskey falls over. No challenge needed. Now, clearly, Heskey's poor performances out in the Far East weren't his fault. So who or what was to blame David's team? So I take it he got a lot of abuse over here. I didn't think I, he played poorly. Over I didn't think he played all that badly either. So Are you trying to stand up for him? Yes. Because he obviously couldn't stand up for himself. <laughs> hey, Blake, you play football, don't you? <laughs> what team is it? Blackburn Rovers? <laughs> With Dwight York? Yes. Could you get us some of his videos? <laughs> Have you seen Dwight's videos? Have you indeed perhaps been in Dwight's videos? No, no, no. You've adopted a defensive pose now, if you don't mind me saying so. Old rumours when he played at Villa. Doesn't do that now, he's Rovers. But he must still have them in his collection, doesn't he? You don't throw them out, they're like old friends or children, you keep them. 
I can't imagine that Dwight's taped Midsummer Murders over them, can you? <laughs> Come on, Emil Heskey. He complained um, some of the effect about his shorts being too baggy or too large, I believe. Yeah, I'll give you three points. I'll Thank give you three. You. Well Eskew said he was below par because his shorts were too baggy. This meant, apparently, that it was all too easy for defenders to grab hold of them. Although he looks slow, Emil Heskey is actually the quickest player in the squad over his favourite distance, six feet vertically downwards. <laughs> Early on in the first game, Heskey went to ground and loudly shouted in vain for a penalty. Although, to be fair on the ref, the replay did show that the national anthems hadn't yet finished. <laughs> Gary's team, we stay with the England team for you. Here they are thumping Argentina 1-0 in the World Cup group game. Hold the cups and the glasses back home. You can smash them now. Beckham has scored for England. 44 minutes and he's done it again. Now, according to the Argentinians themselves, there was one reason and one reason only why England won. So what was their excuse, Gary's team? Can we just um, pause, and uh, as that was David Beckham, and, you know, we've often slagged him off on this show, but it's nice that he's named his new child Romeo, which is a touch of class, isn't it, you know? <laughs> what? It's a shape character from Shakespeare's Romeo and Juliet, and I think it's very good. And I think it'd be nice if this sort of this bit of culture permeated football. I might even get to the terraces. And they'd chat things like, does she take it up the Coriolanus? <laughs> Which apparently is Titus Andronicus. <laughs> <laughs> we thrashed him in the World Cup. You thrashed him in the World Cup, didn't you, Gary? We oh. did all right in the World Cup. You did, didn't you? Yeah. So you sent this line and packing. Well, I'm not one to blow my own trumpet, but as Mark Lawrence is not here... Well... Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Well, it's all true. Nothing to do with Owen diving, that's too obvious. Nope. Um, I think we should throw it open to the nice ladies and gentlemen. <laughs> Anyone here know? Listen, you'll be in Panto soon enough, mate. Just get on with it. <laughs> indoors, no good indoors, because that was the in indoor. Yes, but the roof wasn't on, was it? Yes, it was. That's why. The roof I was there. On. It was on. You were there. Well, I didn't see the roof. Mind you, I had a few. Let's be honest. I think it was warm. It's always <laughs> It's, not, oh, a roof, it's not a roof that so comes off. It's they would a pitch that slides in. in. That's right, yeah. <laughs> it's it's yeah. <laughs> I went to a lot of places. Come on, answer the question. I don't know. You don't know. You don't know. Was he, was he? The Argentinians claimed that the reason they lost was they were wearing the wrong shirts. In their previous two World Cup wins against England in 86 and 98, they wore their dark blue second strip, whereas this year, and the last time England beat them in 1966, they wore their traditional blue and white stripes. After that match, Trevor Sinclair mistakenly got on the Argentina coach, and by a curious coincidence after that match, Ulrika Johnson mistakenly got on the England coach. <laughs> Gary's presentation of the match was given a rave review by sultry journalist Barbara Ellen of The Observer under the heading, Why the Lineker Effect Means Women Score Every Time. She wrote, Lineker and Hansen produce perfect television simply by rambling away like affable old grandads. <laughs> According to Diego Maradona, the reason why Argentina lost is because Diego Maradona wasn't present. He'd been refused entry into Japan because of his criminal record. Actually, Gary had a criminal record in Japan as well. Two years, no goals and 13 billion yen. <laughs> 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 nice. right, finally, he's admitting it. It's great work. It's <laughs> <money bags. laughs> so, at the end of that round, Gary's team have three points and David's team have six. Yes, well, and thanks to you. It's a good call for you, Gary. We move on to Sporting Bluff now. David's team, it's that perennial losing semi finalist for you, Paper Tiger Tim. Now, Henman puts his annual march to the Wimbledon semis down to a superstition. What is it that Tim does for good luck? Tim Henman always has his hair cut just before Wimbledon. Tim Henman always eats at the same restaurant just before Wimbledon. 
Tim Henman always asks for the same driver to drive him to Wimbledon. What a big baby Tim Emman is, eh? <laughs> I'll tell you why we don't win, because he's like some sort of like little mummy's boy running around out there. What you want is a good working class fella that'll be fire in his belly. Not one of these posh twats who run around and Mumsy brings him teas and elevenses and <laughs> the butler brings him fresh balls out on a silver platter. <laughs> and when he, when he tries to get excited about it... <laughs> I tell you, I've yeah, got more sporting blood in me than Henry. He runs around like a little Nancy boy. <laughs> How can you let the bloke beat you with an ace on the final point of the game? It's disgusting, isn't it? It's, it's shocking. <laughs> it's disgraceful. I'm leaving. I'm really upset. <laughs> we don't wreck these posh round, are we? Of course you wouldn't, would you? No. It's new money. <laughs> new money. The Henmans. It's, it was after the dissolution of the monasteries. <laughs> Uh, but I should just point out, Brad, the question there about the haircut, I suspect, hasn't been aimed at you to make you feel uncomfortable. We wish to <laughs> welcome you to our country. Well, how old were you when, when your hair started going, when you started losing it? About 23. But, man, that's a young... And did you, would your father... Had your father lost his hair? Or? No. Wow, so just you in the family, that must make you feel very positive. And <laughs> <laughs> how long before you decided to shave it all off? Pretty much a year after. Just, really? yeah. I admire that, because don't you feel sorry when you see people clinging to the last few hairs? <laughs> <laughs> I know someone, no names mentioned. Names, every one of them. They've got a name. <laughs> when one of them falls out, he buries it at the back of the garden in a matchbox. <laughs> when did you get a yak stapled to your head? <laughs> <laughs> See? When he wakes up, he's fine. <laughs> While we're speaking tennis, can we just uh, stop for a second and consider Serena Williams' tight, all-in-one, leather look have you ever seen a derriere as firm and proud as that? You put a potato up there, you get chips out the other end. <laughs> you could lose a finger, couldn't you? That's enough now! NASA Hussein, with his brittle bones, he wouldn't last three seconds. That's enough! He'd be like, he'd like, he'd be like one of Bernard Matthews' boneless turkeys by the time she'd finish then. Be a little bag of skins. <laughs> Tennis players and haircuts, because you, you know when Sampras goes in for a haircut, he always asks for a little bit off his back. <laughs> he is a knuckle-dragging chimp, though, isn't he? <laughs> I, I mean that respectfully. Yeah. I admire the man, but he is like a bloody yeah. orangutan, isn't he? <laughs> I'd go with restaurant, because of, um, I think most athletes, before they, uh, they have matches, they like having their, uh, their normal mm. food, yeah. Well. So you think Gary was telling the truth? Let's see if you're right. Yeah. Yes! The restaurant in question is Nobu, a Japanese place in Park Lane. Tim likes to relax there in silence for a couple of hours, the peace and quiet broken only by nine seconds of furious banging as Boris Becker knocks up a Russian model in the linen cupboard. <laughs> Tim's other superstition is that he always showers in the same cubicle before and after every match. Before the semi-finals, he leaves it running. <laughs> Tim's wife, Lucy, is about to give birth. The proud parents have already converted the spare room, or the trophy room, as it used to be called. <laughs> Gary's team, it's that literary giant, Roy Keane for you. Here he is, making his excuses and leaving the Ireland team just before the World Cup. And I'm happy to be going home. Happy to go home to see my family. Any regrets at all? No regrets. But it's not Roy Keane's book we're interested in, but rather the book he's reading. He recently became the first footballer in history to be photographed in a bookshop. But what was he buying? Roy Keane was photographed buying an anger management manual. Roy Keane was photographed buying a cookery book. Roy Keane was photographed buying an interior decoration manual. Could have been the anger management book. And he couldn't fit the book in his bag, so he broke his spine. <laughs> <laughs> It'd be fun to go to Waterstones and hide all the anger management books. <laughs> Spurs on top of the league! So they are. Have you read the book? I've ghost read it. <laughs> Let's choose them. Um, uh, Jonathan, go for Jonathan. Uh, interior decorating. Okay, so you think Jonathan was telling the truth. Let's see if you're right. Mm -hmm. No. In 
In fact, Brad had it right, and here is Roy himself buying the book called Don't Sweat the Small Stuff by Richard Carlson. Amongst its nuggets of advice is resist the urge to criticise, stop blaming others, and practice humility. And if that fails, elbow them in the head. <laughs> Actually, Roy doesn't intend to read the book. He's going to light it and push it through Mick McCarthy's letterbox. <laughs> After he returned from the World Cup, Roy Keane confronted reporters outside the gates of his home, holding a big dog on a lead. He's pretty fierce. If he wants to sniff your balls, you'd better let him, said the dog. <laughs> Key's book attacks Mick McCarthy for finding time to appear on this show, so obviously Roy finds time to watch it. Well, we're not scared of you, you big, rugged, supremely talented midfield colossus. <laughs> sir. Although Gary says, you're just a soft Mick git. <laughs> and at the end of that round, Gary's team have three points and David's team have nine. <laughs> this could be a first. Time to get physical now as we play Field the Sportsman. Gary and Rory, take your positions. You have the traditional 90 seconds to work out who's come between you. Blindfolds on, please. Can we have our first mystery guest, please? Okay, and your time starts now. There's nobody here. Is that you, Rory? Now somebody tripped me out, it's Roy Key. <laughs> oh, what is it? I'll just check that it's not Ser it's oh. Serena Williams first. Oh, it's somebody shaggy. It's Brad Friedel. <laughs> it's Brad, get back. It's not my old mate Angus Deaton, is it? <laughs> Make sure you get the money first, dear. <laughs> Is it Emil Heskey? <laughs> when did you last see your contact lens, son? <laughs> you know, hey, how are you going to get press ups? Okay, let's do a press up. I'll race you to first to ten, all right? Uh, go! One, two, uh, three, four, uh, four, uh, five, six, seven. <laughs> Is it the press up, man? Is it the world it? press up champion? It is Paddy Doyle, the world press up champion. Jonathan David. Did you see a little bit of, you know, the mask coming off early there by any chance, Nick? Well, I don't mask. think it was going to help them. <laughs> <laughs> hey, I can hear a bell behind there. Can you? Could be that cow I ordered. <laughs> <laughs> We've got the world leprosy champion coming up. <laughs> I'll take them a few fingers for the kids. It's right. <laughs> can we have our second mystery guest, please? There's <laughs> definitely a bell. Okay, and your time starts now. <laughs> David, Hang on, what? is it Serena? It's, oh, it's Serena. <laughs> Look, you're meant to be felt. I don't know who you are. That's what you're here for. <laughs> Just be careful and enjoy it. <laughs> I'm very nervous, this one. Not quite sure this I'm just sort of a new show, David. What's I'm that? a celebrity. Let me in. <laughs> How many? Oh, oh, <laughs> this one's covered up. This I mean, one's. Well, it's better than it? Commonwealth no. Games. And it's our. Is it a casting call for Dwight York's next video? <laughs> Fabulous award winning, medal winning swimming team. <laughs> yes, it's our seven Commonwealth gold medalists.
So at the end of that round, Gary's team have six points and David's team have 12. We draw matters to a close by playing the name game. The team in the lead goes first, which is David's team. What? As many names as you can. The next 90 seconds starting now. Right. So, uh, first name, Dennis the Menace had a dog. The dog's name was? Nasha. This is a bloke who doesn't like you. He plays cricket. Oh, we're going very well. Um, Hussein, that's yeah, Hussein. Hussein, well done. All so, oh, right, here you go. She's a, if you saw Sport Relief, she was on it. And uh, Sven, I believe, enjoys a bit of Sport Relief occasionally with her. <laughs> oh, lovely. <laughs> He's one of your country folk. Uh, first name, there was a, co a comic character, a little boy with lots of money. His name was Richie. Rich. Okay, and second name is um, always like if you had a laser and you were s s shining it into his eyes, it would be a laser beam. Beam, which beam? Okay. Oh, oh dear. Okay, second name, I think this is a footballer. Second name is what you would call Lineker. <laughs> <laughs> Similar to a pansy and a Nancy boy. A bit kind of, ooh, oh, I don't want to get dirty. Fairy. Bit of a, bit of a. Fairy. No, not a fairy. <laughs> All right, remember, from the Stains Massive, who leads the Stains Massive? Someone G. Ali. Ali, okay, oh. Ali, and the second bit is, when you're servicing your old lady. Yeah. <laughs> she's here. When you're servicing maybe, your maybe old she, lady. She's here. <laughs> she can make... When you're servicing his old lady. <laughs> the noise she makes is... Uh, well, Dick Henry used to go, you are awful. Something you are awful. Ooh. Ooh, Ali, ooh. It's worse, she does more than ooh. Ali, ooh. See, sir. <laughs> yeah, it's a, ooh, get off. Uh, <laughs> Ali, ooh. <laughs> Ali, ooh, sissy. There you go, well done. Um, okay, oh. <laughs> So, you moved on to 16, not a great advance, really. So, 11, we'll win it for you, Rory. The time starts now. We're going to lose. Yorkshireman, Roy Keane, didn't like him very much. Good impression, though. Mick McCarthy. Very good. England's favourite tennis player? Tim Hemmen. Now, this is a US golfer. First name is the same as Flint Stone. Fred. Fred. And Fred Funk. Hang on, I want to say if you would change one letter. <laughs> This is a newborn baby who's named after a Shakespearean character and has two fictional parents. <laughs> <laughs> um, first name, the Chicago gangster Capone, his first Al. name, Al. Al. What's that? Finger. Al Finger. Yeah, and this oh. is very good. <laughs> Jesus, Mary, and... Joseph. Very good. And what's a lout, a sort of thug? Yob. Uh, oh. more, more than a yob. More than a yob. Yobs. <laughs> more, uh, sort of, not a yob, but a, a Welsh yob. Boyo. <laughs> Boyo, yeah, it's an ad. <laughs> Yobba! <laughs> oh, this is good. This is a Sierra Leone sprinter. Is it? Don't shout it out. <laughs> so, guys, team have 12 points, but this week's winner is David Seam with 16. Oh, thank you. Oh, it was a Our thanks to David, Jonathan and Brad, Gary, Rory and John. We're all off to buy lots of copies of Roy Keane's wonderful book, apart from Gary, who says it's shite. <laughs> My name's Nick Hancock. They think it's all over. It is now. Over on BBC Two in just a moment, Andrew Marr and Sarah Cox join the teams in Have I Got Old News For You. Here on BBC One, Patrick Keelty's Almost Live After the News.